Well, I think it, as a historian, I would say that there are always historical legacies that maintain down to the present day. So that since the system was built about a hundred years ago, uh, it has a bureaucracy behind it. It has a whole series of treaties. It has government operations that are built to fulfill the current requirements of the treaty. And uh, this, a certain amount of thinking goes along with this. Uh, this is the way we deal with this issue. This is, this is the nature of the problem. And this is what we're supposed to do about it. So uh, when you add all those together, uh, you get a certain sort of ossification, a certain sort of, we've always done it this way. And uh, certain constituencies are served by this. Uh, bureaucracies can say we're, we're fulfilling what we're supposed to do. Governments can say we're fighting the fight we think we're supposed to fight. And there's plenty of support in domestic constituencies for doing uh, exactly what the treaties require. Uh, sort of a strong approach, uh, anti-drug abuse approach that, that assumes that the best way to do this is to limit supplies to that which is necessary to be available medicinal purposes, and otherwise there shouldn't be any extra, extraneous non-medical drug use. I think there are probably three factors that contribute to this. One is the, the rules that govern the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which require a consensus, require unanimity to get change, and of course that's always a recipe for uh, conservatism. Second, is I think that there's a genuine division in the world about what a good international drug control system would look like. Uh, you now have, emerging just in the last few years, uh, a real uh, pressure for change coming from Latin America, which has never been a real player on international uh, drug control issues before, but a very firm resistance from most of Africa and Asia and uh, that uh, leads to uh, paralysis. And thirdly, it's very unclear of what the, what's a sensible vision of the alternative. We know what we dislike about the current system. Very much less clear what a good one would look like. Well, first, think about the word drug. Uh, if you include alcohol and tobacco in the word drug, or the category of drugs, as I think you should, uh, then in fact it's not the case that international policies have proved entirely impervious to change. A good example would be the 2003 treaty uh, regulating tobacco. So in one sense, there has, and it's especially in historical terms, there has been movement. But with respect to heroin and cannabis uh, and drugs of that nature, uh, you're right, there has been relatively little change in the status of those drugs. I think that's largely due to the fact that they still remain major social and medical problems of concern to international elites. International drug policies reflect a combination of moral and political concerns that have been expressed in the negotiations that have led to the treaties. And so very powerful moral interests have argued around, for example, the preference for abstinence that comes from the Christian Protestant tradition of Western societies that have been most powerful in the drug um, control negotiations, primarily the United States, which has been very influential throughout the history of drug control. And on the other side of that, the drug control system also does reflect the political interests. For example, the interests of Britain and the USA in how it was running its colonialist policies at the time, 100 years ago, when drug control instruments were created. And so we can see drug control as the continuation by other means of moral and political debates and the expression of the balance of powers between countries. It's an important question, I guess. Um, and one that's on the minds of a lot of people these days as there, as there emerges a more and more viable global drug reform movement. I think part of the answer is that um, world and national public opinion, depending on the country, has not quite caught up with the ideas that are being generated about either the failures or possibilities of the current um, drug regime. Um, so this is not an issue on which there is uh, a massive social movement emerging. Um, though there are a number of outspoken critics worldwide about the um, shortcomings or failures or harms 
of the international um, drug system. So I think that's part of the, the reason a constituency as yet has not emerged. I think a second reason that was extremely important in the case of the United States, which I would know best, um, is that there are very entrenched um, institutional interests in favor of continuing the system as we have it now. And some people have actually come up with a name, uh, unwieldy type of name, uh, the um, kind of drug incarceration um, uh, industrial complex, something that's analogous to um, uh, what used to be called the military industrial complex in the United States. Billions of dollars and thousands and thousands of jobs are linked to the idea that we need to have a punitive drug regime. Everything from the bureaucrats who staff, or the agents who staff organizations such as the Drug Enforcement Administration at the top, or the President's Drug Office, down to police departments that become, of the local level, very dependent on drug-related funding um, and drug-related crime to keep themselves at, on a heavy um, activity to um, uh, the prison system in the United States, um, which is uh, filled to the brim with both ordinary drug offenders and um, uh, uh, dealers. So there are institutional interests in favor of not questioning the regime as it exists today. I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, You've got to remember that the international system has been developing for a long time. This year is the, the centenary of the system. Uh, the current UN treaties are based on a series of treaties that began in, in um, 1912. Um, so there's a great deal of bureaucratic inertia embedded within the system. So that's in terms of um, systems or structural approach, that is one of the key reasons really I think why the system itself is, is so resistant to change. Um, further, we must remember that many states still support the current approach of the international system. So while there's a growth among states in various parts of the world that are challenging certain aspects of the treaty system, be that via um, engagement with uh, depenalisation of cannabis, for example, there are lots of states, what we could call, if you like, the prohibitionist bloc, who still support the system in its current form. They still support the, the status quo. So that in combination with the bureaucratic structures that I just mentioned as well, help sustain the regime in its current form? Well, um, I'm not sure that I actually agree with the question because I think there has been change in international drug policy. Um, there's been change certainly um, since international drug control first came on the cards in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but that change has tended to be towards greater restriction. So my argument would be that there has been change and that we ought to look at the motive forces behind that change to try and understand change in the present. When you look at the resistance to change, it's obviously any number of factors. First, the fact that my government, the United States, has made the war on drugs a global priority for many decades, and in some respects for the past century. And one can only hope that as it, lo as it loses its passion for this global war on drugs, and as now sort of the Russians seize the baton from us and they're held in such broad disrepute, that maybe that one impediment will remove itself. I think secondly, we have in the United States a massive prison industrial complex that is deeply vested in perpetuating these policies. We huge numbers of people who profit in their livelihoods and in their communities from this war on drugs. You have similar sorts of things elsewhere. I think thirdly, that there's a global bureaucracy committed to a certain way of thinking about drug control, heavily reliant on criminal justice, that just keeps doing the same thing even as the politics change. And I think fourthly, I think it boils down to fear. The fear of an alternative, the fear of what it might be to decriminalize or legally regulate many of these substances and what would happen. You know, most people recognize the global war on drugs has failed, but people are afraid of the alternative. They're afraid that if somehow we let go of the controls, we'll be in a global Sodom and Gomorrah with drugs everywhere and drug addiction massively all over the place. Their fears are almost certainly misplaced, but people need reassurance in order to move into that different way of dealing with things. 
I think partly because a lot of people make good money off of the current war on drugs, that's one reason, and secondly, a policy like policies like these that are that are that are built on moral judgments are especially hard to dislodge. They're not it's you could pile up all kinds of evidence and some people will simply never be convinced uh, that there's anything to do other than try to make societies drug free as much as we know that that's not a realistic goal. Why have drug policies proven so resistant to change? It's a really difficult question to ask to answer. Um, I think because there are so many answers to it. Uh, partly, as we've been discussing at this meeting here today, uh, once you generate or create an enormous bureaucracy around something, it in itself becomes self-referential and very difficult to move, um, self-protecting, in fact. But also, I mean, people are genuinely very concerned about drugs. The public is concerned, and politicians are very responsive to that kind of concern. Um, and in that process, the governments like to be seen to be doing drug control. And what we have in a current system is the image of drug control when in fact we have none. Um, so the governments look like they're doing something quite well. It looks like the international community agrees on it. Uh, so for once, largely, they don't have to fight about something. And I think that's a comfortable situation for all involved. I think there are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, uh, we need to bear in mind that the regime that we've got now has taken an awful long time to come into being. It, it began uh, a century ago and was uh, consolidated in the uh, single convention only in 1961. So you know, that's a long time um, for this process to come into being. And it always takes a long time to unwind any position. Uh, that has been built up over, over such a long period of time. Secondly, there is, um, in any uh, situation like this, a powerful latent inertia that um, makes it very difficult to uh, move away from a system that has been so laboriously created over such a, a long period of time. Any su in any such circumstances, you, you get powerful vested interests emerging, people who actively uh, seek to oppose change because you know, they, are, they are beneficiaries of the status quo. Thirdly, I think that um, politicians generally have uh, decided that um, the precautionary principle is the way to address problems of drugs uh, rather than adopting a risk-based approach. And one can understand why this is because selling a risk-based approach to uh, public can can be a very difficult thing to do. You know, how, if you're a politician, um, can you really tell the parents of a child who's died from a drug overdose that you know this sort of thing happens? It's statistically insignificant. You know, win some, lose some, roll with the punches. It's not really a very effective uh, political uh, me uh, me uh, message to put across. I think one of the really animating factors behind the drug control impulse is that there are just basic fundamental human impulses involved that international drug control regimes reflect, but they don't necessarily produce. This is a basic antipathy to the kinds of drug-taking behaviors that other people engage in, basic fears over intoxicants, intoxication, and to some extent, uh, all of the, the policies and the regimes are really just reflections of some of these basic fears. And I think the very fundamental quality of these things is partly what creates uh, some of the continuity.